Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the meeting of the Georges River Local Planning Panel for the 3rd of June 2021. My name is Paul Burris, and I'm the chair of the panel this afternoon. The panel is currently streaming from the council chambers in McMahon Street, Hurstville. The panel members who make up the panel today are, uh, to my right, Juliet Grant, one of our expert panel members. To my immediate left is Michael Levy, one of the expert uh, panel members, and to my far left is George Vardis, being the community representative of the panel. There'll also be an appearance by uh, Ms Sue Francis, who is my colleague and alternate chair for the last item on the agenda in relation to Princess Highway Blakehurst. Um, Sue Francis will be online to um, chair that item. We are the panel who have been appointed by the Minister for Planning Public Spaces to determine specific development applications, including the development applications that are on the agenda today. And we'll do so in accordance with the Environmental Planning Assessment Act. Uh, the panel acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which this meeting is being broadcast, that being of the Bidigal people of the Aurora Nation. I'm required to advise you that under the provisions of the Environmental Planning Assessment Act, this meeting of the panel is being live streamed and will be made available on the Council's website in accordance with the revised uh, meeting protocols during the COVID-19 pandemic. Interested parties wishing to make representations to the panel were requested to register a summary of their interests. A total of 15 registrations were received and forwarded to the panel. The panel have reviewed the registrations and have advised the council officers they wish to speak to the following persons, which we would call during the course of this meeting in order of the items that are published on the council's website. Um, of those persons, we have um, uh, Georgette uh, Cosidis um, for number seven, Ricard Road, South Hurstville. Philip Wiley for number seven, Ricard Road, South Hurstville. James Cosidis for seven, Ricard Road, South Hurstville. Brett O'Neill for Ricard Road, South Hurstville. Benjamin Black for Ricard Road, South Hurstville. And Alice Chen for Ricard Road, uh, Ricard Road, South Hurstville. And then finally, Nicole Lennon was also speaking for um, the matter at seven, Ricard Road, Hurstville. Um, with respect to the premises at 47 Kyle Parade, Kyle Bay, we have uh, three submitters being De Brett Daintree, um, Anthony Subris, and David and Sylvia uh, Panavarakis. In relation to number 51, Laycock Road, Penshurst, we have Anders Einstrom um, and Patrick Tang. In relation to 2 to 24, Princess Highway, Cogra, we have Lewis Gumulis and Rod Logan. And the final item on the agenda, which I will not be uh, chairing for 591611 Princess Highway Blackhurst will be Adam Coburn. The panel have all received completed assessment reports from the council staff on the development applications. The panel have undertaken inspections of the site, uh, of all the sites and nearby localities for the matters also on the agenda. We will deal with each of the applications in order of the published um, agenda on the council's website being uh, 7 Ricard Road, South Hurstville, 47 Kyle Parade, Kyle Bay, 51 Lake Park Road, Pensers, 2 to 24 Princess Highway, Cogra, 143 to 149 Boundary Road, Forest, uh, Forest Road, uh, Boundary and Forest Road, Peakhurst, which is the planning proposal. And then finally, 591611 Princess Highway, Blakehurst. Um, as required by the local planning panel code of conduct, members are required to disclose any conflicts of interest with respect to any of the matters on the agenda uh, today. The relevant forms that's prescribed by the Department of Planning will be completed and are tabled for the council to be included on the online minutes. Um, no panel member, members have uh, disclosed any conflicts of interest with respect to matters on the agenda today, though um, I am uh, conflicted with respect to the last item, which uh, relates to 591 to 611 um, Princess Highway Blakehurst, and I will be taking an active part in the um, discussions, deliberation or the determination of that matter. As we progress through the matters on the agenda, only those persons who have been registered to speak will verbally be able to make representations to the panel. I would ask those persons that are invited to speak via 
Skype, that they speak clearly and have a volume that will project into the speakers to assist those viewing the live stream so they can be heard clearly and they can hear what has been said. At this time, I remind those persons that any defamatory, discriminatory or offensive language may, uh, that, are that is used may result in the author being exposed to liability to which this council or the panel take no responsibility for. Uh, once we've heard all the oral submissions on particular applications, we will then move to the next application. Members of the public are free to continue to listen to the broadcast. The determination of the applications will be made in the closed session, which will not be live streamed. The determinations will be available on the Council's website within 24 hours of this meeting being held. So I'll now um, move to the agenda and call the first item, which is um, number seven, Rickard Road, South Percival. And first up, um, we have Georgette Cosidis. Would you be there? Georgette, are you there? Yes, I am. So if you can speak to the panel now. Hello, Ms. Cossets. I'm. You're currently before yes, the panel. Yes, right. I'm Georgette Cossets. I'm a semi-retired part-time French um, tutor. So I live next door to the proposed um, temple. Um, so my main concern, among quite a few of them, but the main ones is that it's. Um, Actually, the even just the language of the use from a four-bedroom dwelling house to a place of worship uh, with associated works, that in itself kind of really, uh, really, I guess, offends me because it is a four-bedroom dwelling house. And just the whole idea of converting it into a public place of worship uh, doesn't sit well with me. Um, now, it's also, there's, there's a whole objection, one being that uh, uh, in regards to the parking, where we are expecting 20 plus people to be sort of in attendance there, and that the premises are to operate uh, sort of 24-7. Uh, we've, I think, by my reading, nine plus people actually living there. Uh, so my uh, one of my concerns is how are we going ever to monitor uh, the 20 people plus nine that that are going to sort of reside there. Um, I, I'm I'm very very close to the property. So if I lean, if, just if you can visually picture it, if I lean across from my one of my windows with a broom handle, I could probably touch the building itself. Uh, am I still on? Because I, I I don't know if I'm if you guys can still hear me. Um, so proximity is is really yeah, the, the the concern of mine and uh, the parking. At the moment, there's uh, next door to number seven, there's a 14 house that is, uh, near completion. Uh, so th that's already very crowded in uh, Ricard Road. And I I'm sort of a little bit sad for those 14 potential new neighbours that have no idea what's really being planned next door to them. Um, and uh, just the noise aspect of it, because with the rituals that would be an ongoing practice 24-7, um, I would find that really not not conducive to the way Ricard Road is, to what Ricard Road is, so the noise aspect of it. Um, I am talking, I have no idea whether you guys can hear me. Yes, we Am can. I on? We can hear you. Oh, you can. Okay. It's just like it's the, yeah. It's, it's just because of COVID and stuff. Or if we can't actually physically attend, so you can still hear me. Well, yeah. The fact that I said about the COVID side of it, it's it's actually allowed me to spend a lot more time at home. So I'm um, sort of very housebound bound with some restrictions and so forth. So I'm really very, I just got to really love my street a lot more with the fact that I was there at home all the time. And, um, and uh, my routine is also includes the babysitting of my grandchildren. So with, there's a lot of 
coming and going in my household. I'm a mother of four with two married daughters and two sons in their 20s, which there again are regular visitors in and out. Uh, just our lifestyle is just your normal everyday um, household, family household, with weekend gatherings on our deck, which is like I said, very close proximity to the next door. And um, it's, it's just the idea of whatever we are going to do, whether that will then create a problem with them being a religious order of some sort. So I really don't think that it's really suitable at all to be in our street. Um, we, in regards to the parking, which I've um, mentioned, um, we've potential 14 townhouses next uh, next to seven, Ricard. I'm number nine, there's seven. And next door from lot five, there's 14 new townhouses there. Just the congestion in, in that um, area there, I just don't think that this is at all suitable to uh, to where I live, to where I live. Um, Am I still on? And with the combination of boarding house and place of worship, um, there again, ins and out of strangers, I would say, because it's a public place of worship. So that could be at any time or day or night, uh, these sort of goings on could be happening. Um, like I said, I, I'm next door to that, so I'm really very directly affected by that. And if anybody has been in our street, it's just your normal average suburban street with villas around, with duplexes, with just normal families and, um, you know. Um, so the, the idea of a Ms. public... Ms. Corsidis, um, I think you're out yes. of time. Have, as yes, you yes. wrap up, please, because we, we have uh, quite a number of speakers to get through. Yes, yes. Well, I'm, I'm in a nutshell, I'm saying I'm not in support of this proposal, all right. given all the reasons that I've given. The, the amount of people that are going to be attending the place, the noise that's going to come from the place itself, the traffic that's going to uh, increase in our street. So that, in, in all that, are a public place of worship in a suburban street where we are now just doesn't, doesn't. Okay. It's just not, not have the to right ask thing you to, wrap to do. Up now, man. Yeah. Well, I think I've kind of said everything. I will allow right. the others to put their point of view. Thank right. you very much. Just please stay on the line, as the pan panelists may have a question for you. Um, can yeah. I ask, um, with respect to your your number nine, is that correct? Number nine. Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, in relation to the the amenity impacts to your property. You say yes. that it will be noise primarily. Is that correct? Yeah, noise, noise, traffic. Um, I mean, just the fact that, uh, that there's, there's the, the fourteen, the fourteen townhouses that are were being built sort of gave me an inkling of what it can be like when this street is very busy. Yeah. With rubbish around. I mean, that to me that was like really this is what goes on when you're street is really busy with extra cars and extra people that don't belong in your street. So watching what's happening at the moment in Ricard Road in regards to the to the townhouses really gave me an inkling, like having to collect rubbish every day in front of my place that was left behind right. by people that were visiting the area. So to me that kind of really sort of more or less tells me what it can potentially be like yeah. when you have a temple next door to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll just see if there are any other questions from my fellow panelists. Julia. We, we understand that the, the the church has been operating already and further to what the chair said. Yes. As yes. the closest neighbour, um, yes. I'm just wondering what your concerns and experiences has been uh, been with uh, the operations of the church today? Yeah, well, let's see, I, I guess I was very naive uh, at, at the time when this was going on, but you have to sort of take into consideration that the place is basically 
was basically empty most of the time because it was only to allow the um, uh, you know the nuns who were on visas that came to stay there. My understanding at the time was they were just visitors and they were staying at someone else's place. I had no idea at all that potentially down the track that was was going to come about. So, um, and due to COVID and all the borders were closed, no one's been around in that premises now probably about 18 months or so. So no, no, so it's not being used as that at the moment as, as it is. But while prior to COVID, it's now been my understanding, which is like I had no idea that they were actually operating illegally and so forth. That was just made, you know, I was made aware of that. Um, yes, so the, the chanting was going on, the noise was going on. Our Sundays were like, you know, cars everywhere in the street. But for some reason, I think the whole street we were kind of, because it was sort of subtly increasing and every now and again we had that little lull when the visa ran out and they went back home. So I think it was really sort of on the false pretenses to, to, to us and the neighbours what was actually going on. So it was something that started off as something like, oh yeah, isn't that cute and nice next door and they're very friendly and I got to know them. But now it's it's just become to me very much more a problem because we're looking at permanency of having that sort of set up. We're looking at like, and I, do, I really feel, uh, you know, it's as a duty, as a citizen, as a next door person there, that I really have to speak up. I really have to, to be a voice and sort of say, well, this is not something that was meant to be just like, oh, I'm staying at my friend's house while I'm on holiday. All right, Miss, Miss Cassidus. I, I, Miss Cassidus, yes, if I can interject, please, ma'am. Miss Cassidus, I, I think you've... A major point. Um, thank you for yes, answering yes. the questions. Mr. Vance, yes. do you have any questions? No questions. All right, we, we need to move on, ma'am. So thank you very much sure. for your submission. Um, yes. Would Philip Wiley be there, please? Philip, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, you can talk to the panel now. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Oh, Wiley. Okay. Yes, Philip Wiley here, yep. Yes, you're currently before the panel. Can I ask, whereabouts do you live, sir? Um, I live in uh, Forest Road, Penshurst. Right. Now, my, my connection is that I'm Georgette's partner, so I'm, as I understand, a very frequent visitor to um, to, number, to number nine, Ricard Road, and I have been for a long time. Right. Um, okay. Can I ask you okay. this then? Um, sure. You, you've been listening to what Georgette has said, correct? Yes. Are there any other matters that you need to put to the panel that um, uh, fresh matters other than the matters that Georgette has already uh, covered? No, well, I could, we read out most of the ones that she did. The only one I would say is that um, she mentioned that the 14 uh, new dwellings that are going to start up the, next to number seven, but there are also new high rise or new high density uh, dwellings happening across the road in, from her and Ricard Road, and there are other ones that are muted. Uh, mooted, I mean, so it will be an ongoing uh, amount of extra traffic over the next few years. There will be more and more people living in that street. Yeah. Um, there is a, a school down, there's a school entrance down Ricard Road, so that is, it's become quite a busy road from people using that school entrance for the, for the Mara School uh, across the, the other, other street. So again, this gets a lot of traffic through um, uh, school, to school times. And I just think, I just to reiterate, I don't think it's fair that a, a public place, public uh, facility, whatever that might be, or whatever mm -hmm. denomination, whatever function is to be used in a, a place that is a, muted as a, um, as a normal dwelling. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. Just hold the line and I'll see if there are any questions from my fellow panellists. Okay. Thank you, sir. There are no further questions. I thank you for your submission. Okay. Our next submitter is James Coisidis. James, are you there? Hello, James speaking. 
Hello. Is that Mr. Koisidis? Yes? Yes, yes. Um, okay. Thank you. And um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I'd like to second what the first two um, responders have said. Um, yeah. I am the son of Georgette. Um, I was about to ask you that question. Of, yep. Uh, in terms of um, things that haven't, I second everything they've said. Of also being in the house during, so in the last two years, when there have been people in there practicing um, their their worship, there hasn't been 20 people in there, but all you need is five people chanting the same thing, and that sound reverberates. So when I was looking for the proposal, I really think there's firstly there's insufficient um, things that have been put in place to limit the noise. Mm. Um, if you have 20 people at any time, early in the mornings is when a lot of this happens and later at night as well. Um, so that's definitely going to be something that I don't think the proposal really allows for. Um, and secondly, just the nature of the street. Rickard Road is a very steep hill. So if I'm unable to get a parking spot um, close to where my destination is and I'm having to park further down the hill, you could imagine unloading the car with, with children with prams and everything like that. It doesn't make the area accessible. Um, so there are some two things that I think add up on what's already been mentioned before. All right. um, I'd also like to just put forward that I did try to email um, and attach a video of the street just to show visually what the parking is like. Um, I passed that on to the council. Hopefully you guys are able to have a look at that. It's just a video of me walking down Ricard Road and it is absolutely chockers. It is packed. There is nowhere to park. And it really upset me that in the proposal, it states that there is ample street parking, which is an absolute fabrication. And this is full before the 14 dwellings are there, plus the high rises or the apartments that are gonna be across the street. Not to mention that that Mara school that's been built in the next street over is a growing school as well. So already, the street and the parking is at its limits. It is only going to get more populated. Now, definitely, people need a place to live, that's for sure. But in terms of to turn a dwelling of a home that could be used for something else, when there is no parking, and that noise is going to affect residents, I don't think that it's something that is going to help the residents in there. I went door knocking up and down Ricard Road, and there's a lot of people that in okay. terms of the technology, of, would have been able to attend in person. It's been very hard for them not in terms Mr. of Coyce doing Leaders, it online. Yep. I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. Um, you're yep. nearly out of time. Okay. Can you please wrap up? Yep. No, that's about it. The noise and the parking um, is definitely not up to scratch. All right. Thank you. Thank just hold you. the line and much. we'll just see if there are any questions. I don't have any further questions. I understand your concerns. That's right. Yep. All right. Thank you. Mr. Levy has a question for you. When, yep. when you were saying that you can hear people chanting when there are only five people there, where, whereabouts mm. are you hearing that from? Is that uh, from the rear yard well, area um, or inside where, the house? Um, well, it, from inside the house, where my mother's bedroom is and where the spare bedroom is where my nieces and nephews stay when they're sleeping over, that wall actually backs up right onto where they are. So our bedroom walls are at the closest point to where the, um, to their place, I guess I should say. So like, like my mother's example of the broom handle, from her you know, window type of thing from the bathroom, you can touch that other wall with a broom handle with your arm out. So it's very close. So yeah, we're as close as you can be to that property. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, sir, for your submission. Thank you. Um, our next submitter, uh, submitters, is Brett and Claire O'Neill. Hello, Brett, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? Hello, is that Mr. O'Neill? Yes, it is. Okay, you're currently before the panel, sir. Would you like to um, proceed? Yes, please. Yes, can I go? Yes, you can, sir. Okay, so um, my relationship um, or, or dealings with the property is that Georgette is my mother-in-law and the grandmother of my uh, two small children. Um, Wh so whereabouts do you live, sir? I live in Pecos. Okay, so you, you don't live yep. in, in Rickard Road yourself? 
No, no, but I'm a frequent visitor to the to uh, Georgette. Uh, we, when we visit as like a family get togethers or if she's babysitting um, my small children. Okay, so um, can I ask you this? Is there any matter that you are going to uh, put to the panel that we haven't heard from the three previous speakers in relation to parking, no, I would just noise, say, amenity parking, loss? Parking, noise, amenity loss, all those things. I think everybody's been fairly clear about that. Um, right. And I've just anecdotally, I've noticed the increased uh, vehicles in the street. And often when I go there with my kids, I need to park quite a way down from right. um, my, the, the grandmother's house. And then we're traipsing up the hill uh, and it really is, isn't convenient, um, especially if the weather's bad on the day such as this. And I, I can't imagine that having a religious place of worship there is going to improve that uh, at all. And, you know, there are plenty of commercial sites in the area that would be far better suited to a religious venue that would offer ample parking and wouldn't be interrupting just this normal life that goes on in a, in a suburban street. You know, it's a family street. It's not really a, it, it wasn't designed to have a place of worship where people come and go at all hours. All right. That's your submission, sir? Yeah, that's it. And as I said, you know, you've got the 14 townhouses right next door to the proposed uh, yeah, we understand. We've it's inspected the premises. Yeah. We understand what's going on next door. Yes, yes. All right, just hold the line and I'll see if there are any questions. Sure. Just leave it. No questions. Thank you, sir, for your submission. Okay, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Our pleasure. Um, our next submitter is Benjamin Black, Town Planner, acting on behalf of the applicant. Good afternoon, panel members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Mr. Black. Right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and panel members, for the opportunity. Um, I'm a town planner. I'm representing the, and on behalf of the applicants, um, I was involved in the lodgement and uh, processing of the DA. Um, separately online, I believe we have Alice Chen, um, who is one of the proponents and a member of the congregation. Um, so she will speak after me. Um, I did send a separate email this morning which was admittedly fairly late, about 10.30 or so this morning, outlining um, some of the instruments that are, that are played um, as part of their worship. Uh, and so hopefully, if you haven't had a chance to see that email, uh, it was sent at about, um, I'm looking at now 10.47 a.m. this morning to the panel secretary and outlines a, a, a few. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Black, I can, I can let you know that um, the panel was, um, uh, able to uh, get a demonstration of those instruments. Great, that sounds perfect. Thank you for that. So we heard the, I think there was four particular instruments that we heard. That's correct, and that's what I've outlined in the email. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, so I, I guess I should um, first and foremost deal with the objectors. Um, they're obviously all from the same property, and uh, I think that in hearing what has been said that. One of the biggest issues here is, and something I'll touch on as well, and I was intending to, despite what the objectives have said, is the categorisation and confusion in the assessment report about this being some type of quasi boarding house. Now, I think that categorisation um, on its own has scared the neighbouring residents, and they um, are thinking this is going to be something it isn't. Um, this is purely a a formalisation of an existing use. So the property has been used for this particular function since 2018. It hasn't ceased since. I know there was some commentary there about there not being any operation during COVID, and that's indeed not correct. There have there has been no visitors from overseas for obvious reasons, but the the place has still been operating with the worship conducted um, on a regular basis. So um, I'm concerned that the way that the report has been put forward has thrown the residents into a bit of a spin. Um, and I'd like to reassure them that the, they won't have a boarding house next to them uh, in any way. Um, but, and one of, the, one of the biggest things for us is that this has been in operation since 2018 and it's, it's an honest step by, a step by, the, by the Buddhist people that operate this facility to do things in the right way. Um, and so we've attempted to do that and it's been thrown back at us now um, in an unfortunate way. There's been no, uh, this isn't a DA in response to an order served or a complaint from a neighbour. 
Um, and um, it's disappointing that given the honest approach taken that we're now in this position of defending a refusal recommendation, which is amplified by the fact that um, we've been in constant contact with the council trying to um, get an update, see if we can assist, if we can provide further information, if we can clarify any points, and we haven't been given any opportunity. Um, and that's very disappointing because I think a lot of these things could have been put to bed and ironed out earlier on, um, but, but here we find ourselves. Um, so in terms of the, board, the classification of a boarding house, um, the, the whole purpose of a boarding house is a commercial operation where lodges pay for a room on an independent basis. This is not what is proposed at all. Um, the, uh, the monks that would stay uh, in the bedrooms are an ancillary aspect of the proposal. Um, they are not separate, they do not pay to stay there. Um, they are members of a religious organisation. Um, it's, it's akin to having, in my view, a, a swimming pool or a private tennis court. These items aren't specifically identified as, as a permissible land use. Um, and, and we don't call them a recreation facility if they're proposed independently or as a separate part of a, a DA for a house. It's just, it seems totally um, illogical to me to even think of, of this operation as a boarding house. Um, it's no different to say a five or six bedroom house that would have five or six different people who pay a weekly rent and collectively contribute towards that. Um, and that's, I think, how this needs to be viewed. If we would have been given the opportunity, we would have spoken to council about this perhaps being a part dwelling house and part uh, place of worship. But in any event, I still um, am of the view that the uh, residential aspect of this is ancillary to the primary use. Um, and for that reason, it's my view that the entire section of boarding house controls and assessment gives the panel no assistance and cannot be used in any way as a means to refuse the DA. Um, in terms of parking, I'm concerned that uh, there is a, a serious lack of understanding of how this operates. The, the traffic report um, submitted and actually reviewed by uh, McLaren traffic engineers on behalf of the council as a peer review, um, that outlines the parking that we're proposing and in light of the fact that Everyone who comes, or all the members of the of the congregation, arrive by Mr. Black. Can I can I just ask you um, how far are you through your submission? Because you're over time. I'm happy to sure. give you extra time, but um, where are we in relation to that? Are we two minutes I, I away? Think I'll, I, I'll, I'll say about two minutes. Yes. Sorry, sir. About two minutes. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the parking rate in the DCP is one space per five seats or one space per five square metres for public seating. My view is there isn't any public seating. People can't walk in off the street and take a place. There needs to be a private invitation. And so the correct um, uh, generation rate is the one space per five seats. There's 20 as a maximum proposed, equaling four spaces, which we're proposing to achieve on site. Um, the, if, if the panel took the view that that is an incorrect position, um, the very nature of these organisations and their faith uh, encourages the members to uh, respect the environment, use public transport, use means other than private vehicles. Uh, and I think this is the exact reason why there hasn't been complaints to date, because they don't create traffic um, in any way. Um, and in any event, um, the parking would be compliant in my view. Um, there is discussion in the report about there being some traffic impacts, that's from the, uh, the assessing officer, but the traffic assessment actually from McLaren Engineering, they told that there is unlikely to be any significant traffic impacts. That's the words in the report from that particular peer review. Um, I'll move along quickly, there is more I wanted to say, um, but in terms of acoustic impacts, there was a 10 day monitoring period, which is outlined in the report, um, and um, the, the purpose of this is for people to come and have a quiet place of reflect, reflection and meditation. Um, the instruments are used as a, as a rhythm technique to bring people back to centre when they're meditating, not to create a distraction as it would be in, on the assumption it might be a large gong or something like that. Um, so the, the acoustic report has a detailed discussion about what needs to happen. There's, there's glazing thickness, acoustic seals, other things, closed doors. There's measures in their acoustic report that would encourage the panel to look at. Um, 
And in conclusion, uh, I, I, my view is, and I think I've explained it well, that the, the, the assessment is flawed. Even talk about draft DCP as not being a relevant thing and then give the draft DCP compliance check. I'm not sure what the purpose is. Right. Um, there's no Mr Black, can I, can I ask yeah. you to finish up, please? I can, surely. Uh, and, and thank you. Um, we would urge the panel to either overturn the refusal recommendation to an approval or at the very least uh, seek to impose a trial period for 12 months where there can be some monitoring done and we can come back to the council and show that we're operating uh, in a, an appropriate and respectful way. Okay. Thank you. All right. Just hold the line and I'll see if there are any um, uh, questions by the panel. I don't have any questions for you. Yes, Ms Grant does. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Mr Black, could you um, outline uh, where the visitors um, to this facility would generally come from and how long they would generally stay? So are they are they um, local, uh, notwithstanding COVID and international, but but where would your would the visitors who would be staying um, on the premises generally come from and how long would they generally stay in each visit? My understanding is that um, uh, they all work full time. People come together largely outside of um, either in the afternoon or on the weekend. And so they stay for two or three hours at a time. But I'll defer that question to uh, Ms Chen, who's speaking next as, as the proponent. Mr. Levy, any questions? Mr. Vargas, do you have any questions? Oh, just one question, Mr. Black. Um, you mentioned the peer review report by McLaren Traffic Engineering. Um, they queried uh, the methodology employed by your clients, uh, traffic engineers, ML traffic engineers, um, as yeah. to how they arrived at certain conclusions. Do you have any comments to say about that, to respond to that? Uh, only in as far as uh, the, the traffic report does say that it's comforting um, or something along those lines that, uh, that that it's by invitation only. So if it's by invitation only, it can't also say that we've used the correct, incorrect parking method, which would be the public generation rate. If it's invitation only, it's not the public generation rate. Um, so I think that particular aspect of the response isn't correct from uh, McLaren. Thank you. Um, we do have one more question from Ms Grant, Mr Black, so please stay there. Um, is there a plan of management that guides the operation of the facility at present? Most certainly. Yeah, there's a, there's a 10 or so page document as part of the DA. We submitted with the original DA. Okay, thank you. I'll dig that out. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr Black, um, for your submission, sir. Um, now, we have two more submitters. We've got um, Alice Chen, the applicant. Um, I'm just wondering, is Nicole Lennon there, please? Hi, um, can, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, um, can I speak now? Yeah, I'm just wondering, Mr. Chen, are you there? Yes. Okay, would you like to proceed, please? Yes, um, first of all, can I answer the question raised by the panel before in terms of where the visitors are from and how long will they stay each time? Basically, the visitors are like from the locals. They are usually not far away. or if, um, And then each time they come, because we operate by invitation, we don't open, we don't open open to the general public. We don't want anyone just walk through our Bihara. So whoever that's coming will make pre-appointment with us and they will let us know how long they're staying. Um, normally, if anything, they will come on the weekend, predominantly Saturday, supposed to be for maybe two, three hours. They will have a session of maybe like writing, tra transcribing the, the, the Buddhist Sutra, or maybe they will have a meditation session. And when the reverends are here, they may you know, reverend may, they may talk to the reverend and they can get some guidance from them. So just for a quiet afternoon, typically. Sunday, we don't have that many people because we can, I think people tend to move around a lot more on Saturdays. Monday to Friday, 
normally we don't have, we don't invite this to see because when reverends are here, um, they are also practicing reverence. They, they, they require a lot of, like, they have a very strict routine they follow and then we don't normally want people to go and interrupt the reverend unless they're notified in advance. So if that's the case, they will tend to be a very short visit. And the only other thing that we have a regular thing is every month for the Bihara committee, there's about five of us, we have a monthly committee meeting and then we hold a meeting at the Bihara. That's just for five of us. We sit down at the table, have a quick chat, have dinner together, and then we go through issues for the Bihara, anything we need to follow up, and that's conducted on a monthly basis, normally one of the weeknights, and we might stay there for two hours. So that's in terms of the um, the visitor question. And just other general comment, many I guess to clarify, I understand our neighbor Georgette and his her family have some concerns. Um, and it might be because the report that we prepared with the application weren't read in the correct way. And may I please come just explain, in our application, we will not allow more than 20 people. And that's a maximum of 20 people, and that's not 20 plus people like what she was thinking. Another thing is, um, I mean, we sort of, because when we prepared the application, we sort of went a little bit up, but normally, a uh, normal time when the reverends are here, maximum is five reverends, and then the visitors we're talking about maybe five, six people at one point in time. So we're not really talking a very crowded place. But of course, you know, we must allow for sometimes if it's a special occasion, some people might want to come, like on a special Buddhist religious day, which we celebrate in our six days in a year. But that's, that would be a very limited situation. And we do not operate 24 7, and the reverends know us to do the rituals 24 7. In fact, um, we are restricting any ritual activity between, like, I think it's set out in our um, operation management report that our operation plan of management that any activity is restricted between 7 to 6. So we are not making, we don't intend to bring any nuisance to the neighborhood or make any disruption to anyone around us. Also, um, in terms of, I, I'm a bit, I'm not very sure what noise they were referring to in terms of traveling to um, number nine because the worship hall is actually adjoining the number one to five, which is adjoining the driveway. Between the worship hall and the property on the number nine, there's the, the double garage and also there's a toilet and a laundry and other things. So in fact, if anything that we will be very doubtful to for the sound to be traveling through that then. Um, in terms of the street parking, I, I certainly are, we also agree the street parking right now is horrible, but that we see predominantly because of the construction project ongoing at the moment in number one to five. And prior to the construction project, I mean whenever we go to Vihara, I mean street definitely have ample parking, there's no issue at all. And these days for well, the last 18 months or so, because of the amount of worker that's coming outside, it tends to park everywhere. And then that we we think will probably end as that construction is wrapping up very soon. And um, uh, and like I said before, our operation is about invitation. So definitely, because our goal in the Vihara, including all the setup we do, is to provide a very peaceful, and tranquil environment for people to actually come to our Vihara if you want some a moment of peace just to settle down and to really just obtain that that peacefulness internally. And then to us, this is of course we are a religious place, but at the same time this is for general well being and our mental health. And I think at a time like this where everyone's scared by COVID and all these restrictions, a, a place like this provides that that um, uh, it's like a comfort place for us, and then we certainly would not want people to ruin the process. Right, so Miss Chen, Miss Chen, if I could just interrupt yes. you there, ma'am. You're going to have to wind up because we've got a number of speakers on other matters that are waiting. So, yes. is is that the? I understand. All right, so that's your. I submission. think that's what I would like to say. And um, if you have any questions or you want me to clarify right. what we do, I'm more happy we'll to just, answer just that. Just hold on, and I'll see if there are any questions of the panelists. Yes. Yeah, sorry, could you clarify the reverence that's staying said there's most likely a maximum of five, but how long do they stay overnight? Is it one night, two nights? 
is it an extended period? Okay, the reverend actually stay in the in the vihara, and then um, we invite them from China, from the main temple we belong to in China. Each time they come here, the sangha group or the reverend group, they travel in a small group. It's a group of five, and they will live on site, and they will usually stay probably up to three months maximum. They wouldn't because they also need to go back to the main temple to continue their practice as well. Thank you. Mr. Lee, I have a question. Yes. Um, could you tell me how often per year would you have 20 visitors to, um, uh, to the we, For the last three years, we never had, we only had one day we had 20 visitors, but only one occasion. We, we don't really, yeah, only once, you know, since 2018. And on, on, on average, how many people would there be per day visiting? Per day? Well, on average per day will be very little because uh, I can tell you on average if on Saturday, maybe we have four people on average on Saturday, but Monday to Friday, there's no visitors there. And if the reverends are there, then it's just the reverend outside. Yeah, thank you. And then maybe we have one or two people coming to help them with cleaning or anything. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Barnes, do you have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Chen, for your submission. Um, now, we also have Nicole Lennon, who's the author of the report for the Council. Um, are there any questions of Ms. Lennon or the panel? Thank you. I'm here. No question. Thank you. Um, so that concludes the matter concerning number seven, Rickard Road, South Person. The decision will be taken later today and published on the Council's website. I do thank those persons submitting for their uh, inputs. Um, we now move to the next item on the agenda, which is 47 Coal Parade, Coal Bay. Uh, we have Mr. Brett Daintree addressing us with respect to that matter first up. Mr. Daintree, are you there? Not yet. Good afternoon, Brett. This is Monica from Georgia's River Council. I'm calling in relation to today's LPP meeting. Um, you can speak with the panel now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Daintree, you're currently before the uh, the panel. Um, you're registered to speak. Would you like to commence your submission, please? Uh, Mr. McGonnell, could I request that the other two objectors who I have made submissions on behalf of join the meeting at the same time, please? Yeah, that's fine. And that is that David and Sylvia? Pan Borakis. Yes, and um, Mr. Cerberus. Okay. Yes, Anthony Cerberus. Yes, so they're all with you, aren't they? Yes. Okay, who would like to go first? Sorry. Oh, um, okay, so Mr. Daintree, they're not in your office, are they? Certainly not. Okay. Um, all right, um, so perhaps if you can ring Mr. Subras first. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. This is Monica from George's River Council. I'm calling you about today's LPP meeting. You're just on with the panel at the moment. I'm just uh, ringing the other submitters, and so we'll be with you in a minute. Okay. Hello, Mr. Subras. You there, sir? Mr. Subras? Might be the other speaker, Mr. Vigotis. Mm. Um, are, we, are we able to, to get David and Sylvia and Barakas? Okay, thank you. We're just trying, Mr. Daintree. No trouble. Understand the way we're working at the moment. Hello. Good afternoon. This is Monica from George's River Council. Is this David or Sylvia? 
Yes, it's Sylvia. Hi, Sylvia. We're uh, just um, calling about um, the LPP meeting this afternoon uh, and that yeah. you're on with the panel at the moment, ready to go. Are you there? Hello. Is that Miss yes. Panbarakis? It's um, the, the, the George River Local Planning Panel here. Would you like to uh, start your submission? Sure. Um, good afternoon, panel, and thank you for the opportunity to voice our concerns. Um, I would like to raise the following concerns, the first being um, a question around the drainage. Um, we are unaware as to where the stormwater is being collected and how it is being managed on, um, on that site. Um, as we recently have undergone a DA, we, we ourselves submitted some engineers' report around stormwater drainage management, and we we quite don't understand um, how is that being managed. Um, and our concern is um, particularly around the boundary, the rear boundary fence, um, as we have a retaining wall that's been engineered and built um, according to what the structures were there at the time in 2017. Um, however, the DA plan that's being submitted um, shows some significant change and additions and alterations. Um, so we would just want to make sure that we're not going to be impacted at all um, with our retaining wall and the structure itself and place any undue pressures um, to our particular boundary wall and subsequently to the lower land below that because we are about a metre below um, the property. Um, so we would just want to make sure that it, you know everything will be safe for both parties involved and both of us. Um, we don't want to see any premature dilapidation of, of our retaining wall um, in um, essence as well and just to protect um, both parties. Um, we have a few concerns around the privacy, um, just overlooking directly into our backyard. Um, in particular, there is an existing garage um, that there seems to be a proposed balcony at the rear of that existing garage. It seems um, the distance seems to be sort of somewhere between the 10 metres or so from um, the rear boundary. So I guess um, once you place that balcony, it'll come even nearer to um, the viewing platform over our, our backyard. Um, we potentially would like to um, just make a note about the rear area again regarding landscaping. There was some significant removal of some mature trees um, and so um, that as, as a result that's been all removed and we would potentially like to see just some um, something to go in to secure some privacy for uh, on our behalf so that we don't have too many um, peering eyes looking over the fence into our backyard. Um, and just in general, the scale of the building just seems a little bit excessive and bulky. Um, we're obviously in favour for the applicant to renovate and, and do improvements to their home, um, but just so that you know, um, it's going to be in a fair process so that everyone's got good viewing corridors, um, both us looking up into the valley and for them looking down into the valley as well, just so that there's some good viewing corridors and protections in place to ensure that there's no damages um, to any of the neighbouring properties. Thank you. All right, just, just stay there for a moment, ma'am. I'll just see if there are any questions for the panel. Um, now, you're, you're the immediate neighbour to the rear or the side? Uh, to the rear. Right, yeah. And, you, and you're in an island place, is that correct? Correct. Right, okay, understand. Um, any questions, panel? No questions? All right, thank you. Um, thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Daintree, yeah. um, where, uh, have we got Mr. Subras? Is Mr. Subras available? We're just trying to get him, Mr. Daintree. No worries. Well, in the, in the um, interest of time, may I just well, I think Mr. Hello, Subras follow is on, on the issue of drainage while we're waiting? We'll just hold on, Hello. Mr. Daintree. I think we've got Mr. Subras on the on the. Oh, line. okay. Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Subras, it's it's the George's River Local Planning Panel, sir. Would you like to address us, please, on your concerns? Yes, I would. I would. Okay, the floor's all yours. Okay. Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, please, please proceed. Okay. Uh, my name's Anthony Subras. Hello. Yes, please go. Okay. 
My name is Anthony Subris. Uh, I'd like to make some submissions to the panel if I could. Please, please uh, yes. keep going, sir. I would. Hello? Uh, sorry. Um, Mr. Subris, you're, you're live. You, you currently got oh, the floor, okay. sir. Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, panel members, uh, my wife and I don't have any objection per se for the applicant to redevelop his property and increase the amenity for his family. However, we do not believe that this particular design is appropriate given the size, shape, topography, vegetation and streetscape of the neighbourhood. In our view, it constitutes an overdevelopment of the site and as far as we're concerned, it pushes the envelope well and truly. Now, uh, the other uh, observations I wish to make is uh, my neighbours have never consulted us. Uh, they've never told us what they're going to do. Uh, on only one occasion and in passing, they uh, indicated to us they were thinking of erecting a new side boundary, common boundary fence and a new fence at the front, and they wanted me to contribute. And I said, look, that's something we can discuss in due course, uh, because I didn't particularly think we, uh, we needed a new boundary fence. Um, when I first saw the proposed plans in mid-October 2020, uh, my immediate concern was size and bulk, height, uh, apparent FSR, especially given that they'd commenced unauthorised works, uh, privacy, uh, there was going to be a rear balcony at the back of the existing garage, which is built right on our boundary, and they'd be peering into my backyard and uh, the swimming pool where my wife, daughter and, and friends would, would often uh, swim. Um, the plans did not appear to have sufficient detail for my wife and I to properly assess them, which is why we engaged Mr Brett Daintree to assist us. Uh, we also found that a lot of the detail, the heights, measurements and things on those plans um, were difficult to follow given that I'd previously obtained a topographical survey from SJ Dixon surveyors uh, before I'd lodged the DA for uh, some improvements in 2005. And uh, I noticed that uh, there seemed to be a variance of, uh, of some of those measurements. Uh, for example, I note that there's a plan, a site plan, that indicates that the difference from the rear boundary to the eastern wall of that garage is 11.079 metres. That's um, a site plan 02. And yet in the shadow diagrams prepared on the 29th of July, it's shown as 10.267 metres. Now, that's a variance of almost a metre. Uh, in any event, we didn't see any registered surveyor uh, verifying the, the, the relevant uh, levels and heights and distances. And so we didn't have any confidence that the height wouldn't be exceeded and uh, FSRs, uh, for example, wouldn't be exceeded, which transpires that it has. Um, now, whilst I agree with most of the uh, assessment uh, undertaken by the council's town planner, uh, we still wish to take issue with a couple of points. Uh, first, the, the impact on our view when we reverse up our driveway to Kyle Parade. Kyle Parade in the last four or five years since the advent of a, a very successful coffee shop known as the Cup and Cook and another restaurant business uh, has attracted a lot of people. Uh, there's people park on both sides of the road. Uh, this has forced the council to go and draw some lines so that uh, the people weren't going into uh, driveways, for example. And um, there's also a private bus service and a, a fairly constant flow of uh, motor vehicles. And we find when we reverse up, we have a very limited view of the street, especially when there's four-wheel drives and other things parked right along. Now, that view would be diminished even further if there's to be a common boundary fence and a front fence. Um, there's been a number of near misses. Uh, people often go into the driveway across from us and do three-point turns as we're reversing, and you, you, know, you only sort of see them when you come out. Um, we think that we need as much viewing um, space as possible. Uh, and also, in terms of the streetscape, we think this particular uh, overdeveloped site uh, is not in keeping with uh, the other properties uh, in our street at the moment. Uh, at present, there are substantial setbacks from the boundaries. Uh, if the applicant's proposal were to be accepted, we would have major issues with privacy, overshadowing, um, stormwater retention and disposal, uh, and solar access. Uh, in the overall scheme of things, we believe a more modest development should be embraced, and one that may take advantage of the current dual occupancy that they've got uh, in the form of DA1992-106. 
uh, from the rear, uh, we're faced with a three-storey structure that traverses uh, substantially the entire width of the block, and uh, we believe it looks like a block of flats in a low-density residential zoned area, which we think is inappropriate. Uh, so obviously, uh, from our point of view, uh, more substantial setbacks from all boundaries should be incorporated in any future redevelopment. Uh, we have not seen any amended plans. We had no idea that the applicant was proposing to use a hydraulic lift in the proposed new garage area and that he was proposing to park, I think, up to six motor vehicles there. Uh, if any excavation needs to take place to incorporate these sorts of improvements, then clearly uh, all adjoining properties should have the benefit of a dilapidation report. And, and just finally, in the overall scheme of things, uh, we believe that uh, the planning laws and pre-existing neighbours and vegetation in terms of mature trees and flora should be respected by all applicants and good neighbours. So in a nutshell, that's our position, apart from uh, whatever Brett Daintree has uh, put forward, and also uh, the submissions and objections contained in our letter to the Council 25 February 2021. Thank you, Mr Service. Oh. I'll just yeah. stay on the line and I'll see if there are any questions. Um, so, I, I'm, uh, your um, comments about not seeing plans in relation to the hydraulic platform as it's uh, quoted on the plans. So am I correct in understanding that you have not had a chance to look at these plans in detail? Well, I noticed in the council report, there's a mention that the rear balcony has been removed. Well, I've never seen a rear balcony removed from any plan number one. Mm. Uh, when uh, Sylvia Panabrakos and I had a meeting with Lindley Love uh, on the 21st of April, uh, 2021, she indicated to us that she'd recommended to them to remove the balcony, but they hadn't done so. So, you know, I, I was surprised when I read in the council uh, report that uh, they removed it. I mean, as I said, I have not seen any such plans uh, with either the hydraulic detail. I mean, you know, when I say, remember, the, with hydraulic, there's two aspects. There's one for the, uh, the the retention of water and then the, the pumping of the water back up to the street because this property doesn't have a drainage easement. Yeah. Um, and uh, secondly, there's the hydraulic lift so that apparently these cars are going to be taken almost um, into the subterranean uh, you know, partially, and then there's going to be some stacking above them, which, uh, you know, it, it sort of implies some sort of commercial type operation. Mm, okay. Um, in relation to the questions that you, or the comments that you had with respect to the uh, report, um, I think you mentioned that there were some inaccuracies in the report. Is that correct? Well, the, the, the biggest one, I mean, that I have seen is this one that uh, they had removed the second balcony. As I said, if they have, I haven't seen any plans right. that, that, that show that. Because uh, when I met with uh, the, the town planner that prepared the report uh, on the 21st of April and in the company of Sylvia Panabrakos, um, we were told that uh, although they were advised to, they had not taken heed of that advice. All right, thank you. Just hold on and I'll see if there are any questions of the panel. Certainly. Just one question. When you were talking about the restriction to your view line down the street when you're reversing out the driveway, is that predominantly from the new fence on the corner um, at the beginning of the, at the front of the property or, or is it from the, the built structure itself? Uh, okay, uh, sorry, it would be both. Um, and, and in any event, I think they're proposing to have a fence of 1.4 or 1.6. So at the moment, there's a very low um, stone brick fence. It would be no more than a foot high, a foot and a half, maybe two feet. Um, and there's some trees. I, I've got uh, some trees that are planted along the boundary. Uh, so, but there's a little bit of um, a gap between some of these trees. Um, but in effect, if, uh, if there was to be a boundary fence, uh, they were to, to build up to 5.5 metres from the front boundary and have a front fence. Uh, we honestly would not see anything until we were actually protruding out onto the street past the footpath and past the first line of park cars. Thank you. Mr Levy. Mr Barnes. 
Thank you, Mr. Subris. Thank you. There are no further questions of the panel. Um, Mr. Daintree. Thank you for, for listening to me. And panel, so, can Mr. you hear me? Mr. Daintree, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, I take it you're, you're, um, you're acting for Mr. Subris. Um, is there anything further that you need to add with respect to the amenity impacts? Now, I'm not going to repeat the amenity impacts they're playing. Okay. Um, uh, what what I wish to focus on is I believe that the fact that there's no 4.6 means that the panel um, can't grant a consent. Mm. Uh, we're not aware that any 4.6 has actually followed this report. Um, and we would, would not suggest that deferral is appropriate in this case. I wish to take you to page 63 of the report. All right, just hold on. Okay, just just so we're clear, um, the, the there might be a difference between your numbering and ours, but it is a table that uh, commences with um, uh, issue and comment, and the first issue is the existing dual occupancy on site. Is that the same page? No, that's correct, Chair. Okay. That's quite correct. Page numbers match. Um, I'd just like you, the panel, when they're considering this matter, to cast their eyes down this list of issues, because when we then go to um, the reasons for refusal, which start at page 65. Yes. There's many issues that just aren't captured by the reasons for refusal. And I'll leave that to the panel. Um, but I do have a fundamental, fundamental disagreement and the staff, I can't ask the staff questions of course, but the panel can. Um, I believe there's a non-compliance with deep soil landscaping on this site. And in at, at page six of eight pages in my objection letter, which I forwarded through when I registered to speak uh, for the panel to review if they needed to, I calculated that only 16.3% of the site um, has deep soil landscaping. And I provided in figure five in my submission uh, those areas that are deep soil landscaping. Okay. Um, also, panel, as you're well aware, under section 4.151A2 of the Act, the EP&A Act, um, the, the panel are entitled to consider any proposed instrument that's been publicly exhibited. The Georges River LEP has been publicly exhibited. One of the anomalies between the current COGRA LEP and the current proposed Georges River LEP is that in relation to stormwater, the controls are quite weak in the COGRA LEP. Um, likewise, the controls in relation to essential services are non-existent in the COGRA LEP, but similar to the Hurstville LEP, the Georges River LEP adopts an LEP clause relating to essential services, and that includes stormwater. Um, the reasons for refusal should therefore reference that also that the objectives of those relevant draft LEP provisions that have been publicly exhibited and the LEP, as I understand, is near final and certain, um, should be incorporated as well into the reasons for refusal. Um, going back to the table, I think the most critical part is that the second line in the table of page 63 deals with height, breaches of height. Um, my objection is that it, it breaches the LEP height as well, but I'll leave you to question the staff on how they've arrived at their assessment of height. And there is no, oh yes, it does, sorry. Um, it does. It, in reason for refusal for B, it does refer to height, so that's fine. Look, that, that's basically it, panel. I um, 
I know, I know as Commissioner Brown often said that the, the use of the term overdevelopment is a loose term and undefined, but in this case, um, quantitatively, this is an overdevelopment of the site and qualitatively, the impacts of it are unacceptable. I'll leave it at that. All right, just hold the line, Mr. Daintree. I don't have any questions. I understand your submission, sir. Uh, the panel does not have any further um, questions of you, so thank you for your submission and your patience. Thank you very much, panel. Okay, that, that now concludes that matter. A decision will be taken later today and published on the Council's website. Uh, moving to the next item, which is uh, Laycock uh, Road, Penshurst. Um, we have registered to uh, speak uh, two speakers. Uh, firstly, Anders Einstrom from Innovate Architects. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, are you there, Anders? Hello, are you there, Anders? Hello. Hello. Is this Anders? This is I am, yes. This is Monica from George's River Council. You're on with the panel, the local planning panel. Yes, am I on now? You're on now. Okay, thank you. Thank Mr. Eidstrom, um, uh, you're, you're currently before yeah. the panel. Um, I understand that you're, um, you're here to answer questions with respect to uh, the proposal. Um, there's, there's nothing further that you wish to add. Sorry, sorry, I got it. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, can you yes, hear me? yes, we can. Can you hear me, sorry, panel members? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's correct. Um, I'm, uh, we, we have read through the, uh, the report and agree with Council's recommendation. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm just here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. I'll just see if there are any questions. We don't, there's no, no questions uh, of the panel. Mr. Einstein, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Patrick Tang. Hello, can you hear me? Good afternoon, Patrick. You're on with the local planning panel, George's River local planning panel. You know, we can speak to the panel now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panel members. Uh, I, I know uh, I'm the same as Anders. I'm just here to answer questions. So if there's no questions, then I think we can move on. Thank you. All right, just just hold, there, hold the line there, Mr. Tang, and I'll see if there are any questions. I don't have any questions. No, there are no questions. Thank you. Thank you for your interest in registering. Um, the decision will be taken uh, later this afternoon and published on the Council's website. So that concludes the matter of Laycock Road, Penshurst. We now move to the next item, which is 20, 
um, sorry, Princess Highway Cogra. Um, we have registered to speak uh, Lewis Gamulis and Mr. Rod Logan. Hello. Good afternoon. This is George's River Council. Um, this is Monica. I'm calling about the local planning panel. You're with the panel to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hi, panel. Yes, thank you, Mr. Magoulis. Would you like to uh, commence your submission, please? Sure, sure. thank you for uh, having us. Um, I just wanted to, um, my role is that of development manager on behalf of the owner and applicant. Um, essentially, I'm just here to answer any questions that the panel may have. Uh, we actually believe the scheme in its current form is a good result after the various amendments since 2019. Um, so I basically put it to you if you guys have any, any questions for me. If there are any questions, Ms Grant has some questions. Okay. Um, good evening. I'm just wondering if you've obviously seen the report, whether you have any comments on the proposed conditions um, that are included in that report? No, we've, look, we've uh, had a, 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 a look at the conditions. There is, if you refer to page uh, 98 and 99 with regard to the Traffic New South Wales, um, I guess, uh, referral and the only qualm from, from our end would be the re-signalisation of the intersection at the developer's cost or at the owner applicant's cost. Um, all else is, uh, um, you know, uh, okay from our end. Um, but we we were actually a little bit concerned about about the actual you know distribution of costs for for something that may even be uh, problematic once we get into the level of design to actually signalise um, that intersection. It could actually be worse. Um, so that that that's pretty much all all the comment that we've got at the moment. Mr. Levy, Mr. Barnes. All right. Thank you, sir, for your submission, Mr. Logan. Thank you. Do we have Mr. Rod Logan there, please? Good afternoon. This is George's River Council. Are you there? Uh, yep. You're on with the local planning panel. Yep. Mr. Logan, thank you. Do we have Mr. Rod Logan there, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, uh, similarly to, to Lewis, uh, if you've got any questions for me directly on planning matters, um, I'm available to respond. Um, Mr. Barnes. No, there are no questions, Mr. Logan. Thank you for your interest. Um, a decision will be taken uh, later today and published on the Council's website. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's on the phone right now. Please leave a detailed message after the tone. When you have finished recording, you Um, in relation to um, item LPP 024-21, which is the planning proposal for 143 to 149 Boundary Road and 689 to 691 Forest Road Peakhurst. Um, there are no registered um, speakers for that matter and a decision will be taken later today and published on the Council's website. Um, we now come to the last item on the agenda which is um, in relation to 591 to 611 Princess Highway Blakehurst. Now I've declared a conflict of interest in relation to that matter and I will step out of the 
uh, Council Chambers and I will take no um, uh, form part of the uh, consideration of this matter. Um, I'll hand the chair over to um, Sue Francis, who uh, is online to deal with this matter. Good afternoon, Sue, are you there? I'm there. Yeah. I'll just call in. Are all going to leave the chamber or not? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. I guess it's Paul leaving the chamber. Yes, he has. But he is. Oh, he has. Okay, so are we on live? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, in relation, I'm watching the, the uh, streaming, of course, and uh, the streaming, I'm, in, I'm ahead of the streaming. Um, so we have um, the item to, for us today. We don't have any speakers, Councillor, is that correct? Sorry, what did you say? I said, do we yes, have any speakers? One. There's one speaker, I'll call him in now. Who's, what's the name of the speaker, please? I don't have the details. Adam Corbin. Corbin. Thank you. Thank you. He's from Mekon, he's the planner. Hello, Adam, are you on the line? Hello, Adam, it's Sue Francis here. Both you and I are online and the panel is in the chamber. Um, what do you want to say to us in relation to this matter? Uh, sure. Um, I'll just go through There's a few key points I wanted to make in respect to the council report. But I, I think just to start off with at a high level, I mean, what, what seems to be missing in this report is that this is an application that, sorry, this is a sign that's been there for 15 years. The last couple of years it certainly hasn't been. Um, but this proposal is a, is a slight reduction in terms of that surface area. It's a similar height. Um, and we're proposing a digital sign, obviously, which has a, has a clearer, crisper image, um, which has many other benefits around lighting, um, light spill, and the like. So I, I think that's, that's one thing I wanted to make really clear up front, is this is a sign that yeah, ha has been there. The reason that it was removed was that it changed contractors from JC Co to our clients, which is QMS. Otherwise, there would have been an application for continued use of that sign and an extension of that old consent. So that, that's the first thing. And then if I go through some of the key points that I wanted to discuss in the, in the council report, um, I, I think the first thing is the, the report talks about the sign not being compatible with the amenity, the desired amenity, or the visual character of the area. Um, I mean, obviously, we've got to make reference that this is a B2. Um, it's on the Princess Highway, which is effectively like a, an old highway zone. Um, the existing site is, is a car park. It's been used by council um, as a car park. Um, there's references to the proposal not being consistent with the B2 zone. Um, and there's also some uh, rather sort of strange references to planning being about the highest and best use of land. It's not something I've come across before, but obviously the car park is a permitted use. It's been used for public parking, and the sign is a permitted use. Um, in any event, um, you don't have to be consistent with every single objective in a zone. The LEP requires you to have regard to those um, same objectives. Uh, clearly, not every use that's listed as a permitted use in a sign can tick every single box under the same objectives. Um, I, I think the other point, there's obviously several other points, but in our response back, and this is obviously bounced around a bit, this application, um, there was previous recommendations for approval and then the panel uh, refused it. In, in our 8.2 review, we we drew upon the site um, diagonally across the road, the Crystal Car Wash. And, and the reason I raise this is it talks to the character of the area um, and the contention in the report that this proposal is, is not consistent with the desired or, or current character. Um, well, that site, which is the Crystal Car Wash, is 100 metres across the road. And no doubt the panel probably viewed that site and the locality when they went there. That, that sign, which is approved, in 2018, only a few years ago, for a digital sign, has the same amount of signage as proposed under this proposal. It is uh, not quite as tall. I think it's 6.5 metres in height, whereas our proposal 
Well, our current proposal is 8.4 metres in height. However, we have made very clear directions to council that we'd be happy to accept a height down to eight metres, which would be consistent with the uh, council's DCP. Um, so I think that that's that's one key thing because I think again in terms of a of a highway zone or, or highway corridors, signage is is consistent. There's um, if you go across most of Sydney, for instance, you you'll, you'll see signs either on bridges on the side of roads. Um, obviously, it doesn't mean that they can be approved in every location, but it would seem to me that there's a aversion to signage on this site without any sort of tangible planning grounds. Um, there, there's references in the council report to the sort of sign uh, protruding above the single story dwelling to the southeast. Um, those dwellings are actually in an R3 zone, um, which anticipates those buildings being redeveloped in accordance with the zone objectives, again, up to 15 metres. In any event, the proposed signage is uh, purposely, of course, directed towards the highway, away from any residential properties. In fact, the signage is um, it, it's not only directed to the highway, but of course, of course across the road is a, a car wash, which is in an industrial zone. The adjoining zone um, to the north is also a commercial zone. And these zones, in particular the site that um, to which the sign is located, uh, allows buildings um, up to almost six storeys in height. So to suggest that a sign here is, is not appropriate at eight metres in height, which is what we're now proposing, the sign that we're proposing is, is not even on the Princess Highway, it's set back about 10 metres um, from the highway. So you could have a scenario where you have a, have a building um, on this site that is effectively five to six storeys, 2.5 to one FSR, Similar on the adjoining site, yet for some reason there's, there's an aver again an aversion of signage on this site because it's again a, a digital sign. Uh, my biggest concern is there's no real tangible reasons why neither the panel nor the assessment why this should be refused. There's lots of references to, to sort of character amenity views vistas. Well, the, the, the character is that there is signage in this location already. Um, there's a sign 100 metres across the road. It's a commercial zoning, it's on a highway, it's consistent with the RMS transport corridor guidelines as noted in the council report. Um, and it, it is again on a site that has already had signage approved. Um, and, and if we look at the views and vistas, um, well, well, there are none identified. Um, and in fact, if, if there was any views or vistas, they'd be completely removed if there was a compliant building approved on this site, that's five or six storeys. Um, and if you look at that envelope, this sign represents a fraction of what an approved envelope could have on the site. Um, I've just got a couple more points. Yep. Uh, again, the, the sign is, is purposely directed away. There's no real views of business, as, as I mentioned. Um, those, whilst the report sort of highlights the single storey dwellings at the rear, again, they're in an R3 zone. Um, there, is an, there is an existing theme, as I said, the signage is in the locality. Um, you'll note in the council report that this has had approval from RMS. The RMS have given concurrence. And, and let me say that in previous applications, RMS don't give their concurrence lightly. We've submitted a detailed traffic assessment, a lighting assessment, that determines that the, the extent of illumination and light spill is completely appropriate for this location. Um, and, and then just finally, we provided a public benefit offer. Obviously, there's a public benefit here in that the revenue from, from rent will be directed towards council. But on top of that, we're also providing 10% um, of the signage will be for community purposes, as well as obviously any emergency signage that has to be provided in the case of emergency, but the 10% basically represents um, uh, there will be 10, 10 slots um, or 10 screens and, and it'll be one slot um, in, that, in that 10 sequence. So in summary, uh, again, the, the panel is looking at an application here that 
is on a, on a site that's had approval for a scientist who's seeing years. This is an, an improvement. There is no doubt in my mind that this is an improvement and the old sign has to be given some weight. Notwithstanding that, if you were to assess this on a fresh basis, it, it's in a highway corridor. Signs are part and parcel now of highway corridors. Digital signs uh, are better than older signs. The older signs used to have to have uh, scaffolding, similar to what you see. Um, and if you look at um, figure seven on page 280 in the council report, you, you'll see that there was a structure constructed on front of that to allow people to get up there and take the signs down. None of that is required. In fact, and whilst you're looking at that figure seven on page 280, you will see that the, the existing sign that's there and with our reduction in height from 8.4 to 8 metres will have a, a very similar um, sized sign in terms of height. And you'll see from that figure that this sign doesn't protrude obtrusively above the skyline in any shape, form or manner. In fact, it, it's almost consistent with the height of those trees. Um, so we asked that the panel through the applications on its merits, um, on those tangible planning merits, not the, um, I, I suppose, vague and um, somewhat misinterpreted discussion in the report about um, character views and vistas, which clearly there isn't. Um, this sign has existed for many years um, in some capacity on the site and, and will be able to exist in the current um, proposal. So. Um, that's my, my submission to the panel and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for that, Adam. Before I turn to the panel, there's just a couple of questions I wanted to ask. Um, do I assume that Council granted its owner's consent to submit the application? Yes, that's correct. And have you entered into a contract or your, comp your, your client entered into a contract with Council to um, display the sign? Have those terms been resolved? Yeah, there is an existing contract. Um, I wasn't party to that, but no, there's definitely a, a contract uh, entered into on commercial grounds between QMS and Council. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether that's been finalised or is, is that subject to approval or...? Uh, I couldn't say for sure, um, Sue. I, um, I know if there's any changes as part of an approval, that, that would obviously be subject to you know, variation, but um, yeah, I know they've locked in an, an agreement. I, I couldn't, yeah, couldn't tell you for sure as to whether it's okay. subject to consent or not. That's okay. Thanks. Panel, um, Juliet, do you have any questions? No, none for me. Thank you. Um, Michael? Uh, yes, I do, I do have a question. Um, you were talking about the potential to lower the height to eight metres. Is that is that as far as you can go in terms of lowering the height and is there any potential to reduce, for example, the, the size or proportioning of the sign itself? Oh, the, it gets a little bit problematic going it too much further because there is some car parking below, but um, there might be some scope to reduce it in terms of the height. I think in terms of the actual dimensions, these signs come in different preset sizes. So my understanding, uh, a reduction in size below this sort of standard size is, is quite a significant jump. But, um, you know, again, that, that might be something to consider, but we, we haven't sort of considered that this basis because we, you know, obviously feel it's appropriate. But, um, uh, yeah, but I, I think, as I said, I'm not sure on the exact dimension of the next jump down, but as I said, they come in preset sizes. I, I think it is quite significant and, and it obviously require sure, we have to go back to council and, and, and renegotiate some of those terms that we just spoke about before. Okay, because I think there is a point of difference with the sign on the car wash uh, site in that it is set against the backdrop of, of, of vegetation, I guess very much sits within that, whereas this um, proposed sign is, is, is a bit more prominent or, or stark compared to that, um, and, and particularly having regard to the, the vegetation behind, um, uh, I, I think the potential to, you know, certainly lower it as you've suggested or, or potentially even further may be of benefit, but um, thank you, that was, that was right. all my questions. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, George, do you have any questions? No, no, no questions from me. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more questions, which I don't have any, and no more burning questions from the panel, um, I think this being the last item on the agenda, I will now close the meeting. So thank you very much for your attendance. Thanks. Thanks very much.